Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. We have uh, close to 400 pre-registered attendees from all different time zones, so that type of greeting is appropriate. One other bit of housekeeping note from other WebEx panel discussions in the past. Um, your WebEx client may be treating you like you're literally the only attendee at the meeting. So uh, we just want to let you know that you're not alone. Um, I think we're up past 140 people at the moment. So uh, you are not alone. With that said, uh, let's get into this. I want to do a bare minimum of talking because you'll see we have quite the heavy hitter set of panelists and uh, they deserve most of the time today. So um, in a, a little bit of, uh, I, I think the, the backstory here is many of us here are probably burnt out on online meetings or online events. We've all been stuck from home offices for a long time. So uh, we're trying to add a little bit more interactivity options to this type of event. So we're experimenting with slido.com. You can point a web browser there, a tablet there, or a phone there. And if you use the event code TFT, you'll be able to see some questions. We're, we plan to use this to uh, crowdsource some questions from the audience. So um, if you feel like it and uh, you don't want to type your questions into the WebEx chat, feel free to vi uh, visit slido.com, just use event code TFT and you'll uh, pop right into our event. So uh, a little bit more you know, backstory on, on why this came to be and uh, you know, why I'm up here uh, talking to you today virtually. So um, 10 years ago, I made a very, very bad mistake. Uh, there was a, a new and emerging conference uh, coming up called BioIT World and uh, I submitted a talk abstract loosely called Trends from the Trenches, where um, I really, um, you know, I'm in a beneficial position where we do consulting. We're in and out of many, many different interesting organizations throughout the year. And uh, consulting allows us to sort of tell war stories and sort of speak about common trends and pain points. So um, I started doing that about 10 years ago at this event. And unfortunately, we created a little bit of a monster. Uh, the ball kept rolling. The trend stuff kept getting bigger and bigger audiences. And eventually, I felt that uh, it was something that I wanted to back away from. And so we've been sort of changing up trends over a while to sort of add in other voices and other speakers. But the, the reason for this event right now is um, this is the 10 year anniversary of Trends from the Trenches. And, you know, BioIT World is going to do a big thing about it. And uh, fortunately, I'm glad that right now I don't have to worry about that in May. However, um, because the conference has been postponed, um, if, if we can't be together in person, if we can't see our friends and colleagues, you know, together, we can at least come together virtually. So um, thanks to VAST, thanks to CHI, BioTeam, the panelists, uh, we're able to sort of put this virtual event together as a way of sort of not being able to see and interact with you um, in person like we would normally do. So um, again, um, just to really sort of reiterate here, um, the, the, the way we're going to do the flow of this is I'm going to do an incredibly abbreviated uh, trends talk. I'm going to try to go, you know, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then um, immediately hand it over to Ari to run our panel. You can see here, I'm, I'm the least accomplished person on the panel that we've got here. And again, we're just so excited and so honored to have, you know, this level of friends and colleagues who are willing to join us for an event like this. So again, um, same way we thank VAST, the same way we thank CHI, I um, really, really want to thank all of the panelists who took time from their day to day uh, to participate. So the other thing I really want to mention is that um, BioIT World, the conference was not canceled, it was postponed. So logistics permitting, uh, we still, all of us, um, all the speakers, all the panelists, all the trend stuff, and the, the full trends from the trenches talk, is going to be delivered uh, October 6th through 8th in Boston. So again, um, we're glad to interact with you virtually, and we really hope to be able to sort of interact with you a, a little bit more high bandwidth uh, in October. So with that said, let me flip right into the, the trends bit. Again, um, because of uh, the, the nature of this talk, I'm really going to try to go as short as possible. That means I'm going to speak faster than normal and do more slides as usual. So those of you who've seen me speak are probably familiar, familiar with the speaking style. As a way of level setting, I really sort of want to talk about the sort of main scientific drivers that are affecting IT in our world. Um, the next couple of slides, I really want to read them and go into deep dives and talk for hours about each of them, but I'm just going to hit them relatively quickly. So really the, the level setting here is to match the scientific domain to the impact that it has on IT. The first one is fairly straightforward. It's what we've been dealing with for a long time, sequence-based informatics. Generally speaking, you're focusing on storage capacity, CPU rather than uh, GPU-based computing. And if you're doing de novo assembly or other interesting stuff, chances are you have some high memory requirements as well. Moving down, the second item on this table is actually the single biggest change that BioTeam has seen over the last you know, uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, the fastest growing image type, the fastest velocity type of data that we're dealing with is image-based. So it's image-based acquisition, capture, movement, and analysis. The big, you know, the, the, the big elephant in the room is cryo-EM, but there's many, many other sources of imaging now in our, in our research labs that we have to deal with. And the interesting thing is this, has a, uh, this is changing the IT requirements in the bio-IT space. We now actually have to care about both storage capacity and storage performance because a lot of image-based analysis workflows actually depend on a performant file system, where in the past I could get away with the slow but big file system for sequence-based informatics. When I'm dealing with images and also with ML and AI um, in the next slide, um, we actually are starting to see changing requirements where we actually need faster storage instead of bigger storage, um, or both big and fast storage. And finally, obviously, there's a lot more focus on GPU-based computation when you're dealing with images. 
Uh, same thing with ML and MI. So machine learning and AI are coming on strong in our world. And um, the interesting thing about this is also the effect this has on our IT fabric. Um, particularly when you're doing model and model training, the issue is um, you're constantly rerunning and reanalyzing your models, which means you need access to all of your old historical data that was used to represent the, the model. But also your ML and AI workflows are performant based on the speed of the storage system. So again, we're having another driver that's that's sort of calling for faster storage than traditionally we've deployed in the past. And then finally, I won't speak a lot more about chemistry and MD, except it's a really interesting space. Low data, high CPU requirements, most of the tooling is running on GPUs. Chemistry and MD are an interesting workload to shift to the cloud simply because of um, they tend to be CPU heavy and data light. So from a lift and shift aspect, it's actually relatively straightforward to move some chemistry workloads to the cloud where um, maybe data volumes were preventing you from doing uh, you know, a lot of your sequence-based informatics in a cloud environment. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, it's sort of lucked out that we had Vast as a sponsor for this. Vast has been on kind of our radar since even before they, they emerged from stealth mode. And um, since I don't think Vast is gonna talk a lot today and, uh, and they're definitely gonna not talk tech, I wanna leave you with a, a Glenn Lockwood article that was written a year ago when Vast first emerged from stealth mode. Um, it's a really, really interesting sort of behind the scenes take on their technology and what makes Vast sort of uh, a potential disruptor and sort of fairly interesting in this space. So um, again, this is strictly for the storage nerds, but um, I really recommend sort of Glenn's uh, you know, third party dive into, um, into sort of uh, what Vast was doing when they, when they came out of stealth mode last year. So finally, it wouldn't be a trends talk if we didn't try to give uh, blunt and honest and cynical advice to our customers. So um, the, the section of this slide talk is charitably described um, what are vendors going to lie about to you uh, this year? And um, I don't think anybody is going to be particularly surprised. Whenever you have a product area or a market niche that's overly hyped, you have to watch out for aggressive and over, overly sort of cynical sales techniques. And absolutely, um, machine learning and AI are very, very deep in the hype versus reality curve. And so you just have to be a little bit cynical and a little bit careful when you're selecting products or in sort of engaging in your due diligence in this space. Um, the interesting thing, though, is unlike, blank, uh, unlike blockchain, uh, machine learning and AI is actually useful and relevant to our industry. And so really, I want to make sure the case that ML and AI are real. They're driving transformative changes in our industry. It's just that if you're not already sophisticated with them or you're early on in your due diligence, you just have to approach the vendor claims particularly vendors who are slapping the ML and AI label on everything from firewalls to you know, generic software software products. It's just an area that's rife with overhype. It's rife with kind of aggressive salespeople. And the other sort of big take home point here is that the rate of innovation in this space is so rapid that if your organization is not prepared to use these tools, you might actually be better off taking kind of a slow walk because uh, the, the longer you delay your jump into the ML and AI space, the, the more of a chance you have to take advantage of the latest innovations in this space. So again, that's just a little bit of blunt advice here about one of the more overhyped areas in our world today. Finally, um, I've got a couple of minutes left to talk about a, a brief section of my, my normal trends talk. And I decided to concentrate on, on storage and storage related topics. Number one, you know, because we've got a storage related sponsor, but also if you look at the bios of our panelists, we've got a lot of heavy hitter, data heavy, data scientists and data architects on the panel. So it makes sense to focus on, on storage and data management here. The other drivers is that storage and storage related issues still make up a giant percentage of BioTeams consulting. We've solved the capacity problem, but we've still got really gnarly data management, data curation, data governance, and data movement issues. We're also starting to hit the limits of what you can sort of sensibly do on a scale up NAS, particularly when you have emerging workloads, cryo EM, image based, or machine learning, or AI. So let me just talk quickly into you know, this topic, and then I can sort of stop speaking and, and hand it over to, to the panelists. I decided to break up the, the storage talk into four separate topics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how our data is big, talk about how our data is siloed, talk about how our data is dirty, and we'll talk about how our data is biased. And I figure that's a nice way to wrap it up and tie it in with some of the interests and backgrounds of our, our panelists as well. So big data. Um, I guess I should have mentioned, I apologize for the camp, but um, all of the graphics for this uh, slide presentation came out of Animal Crossing on the Switch. So um, if you've never seen um, Nintendo video game generated graphics in a slide, sorry for the camp. So moving into big data here, this is what I've said in the past versus the issues that I'm sort of dealing with now. The problem that we've had right now is that we still see an issue where people are just mindlessly expanding their storage systems rather than making the hard choice to sort of take hold of their data, triage their data, organize their data, wrangle this data. And that was okay. You know, if you didn't have effective scientific leadership and you were okay just throwing money at a problem, you wanted to avoid having difficult conversations with scientists about moving or deleting data, that's fine until now. 
the, the capacity limits that are being stretched by image-based workflows, ML, AI, are starting to mean that people who have maybe spent the past couple of years ignoring this problem or throwing money at the capacity problem are starting to see the limits of those effects. And sometimes those limits are uh, fairly negative in terms of impact on, on an R&D cycle project. The other thing I've been saying in the past is that um, for me, the high water mark is at about the one petabyte level. You really should have a human being responsible for managing and curating your data. We still are saying that because again, in May, 2020, we've started to see, uh, we still see multiple organizations, multiple organizations above the 10 petabyte level who have effectively no governance, no standards, no human led curator. And in some cases they actually have no storage quotas at all. That is coming back in a serious way to bite some of our customers and some of our organizations. And then the final point here now is when you've got billions of files or potentially trillions of files under management, even if you have a human data wrangler or a data curator, she's still gonna need advanced analytics and advanced sort of metadata aware storage profiling and analytic tools if she's gonna perform her role. So um, huge, huge, huge need here on data curation and data management. The other thing I've been saying in the past is, you know, data triage is required. You know, we're generating or acquiring data faster than we can effectively store it for a full life cycle. I've always talked about sort of triage and deleting raw data, particularly if it's cheaper to go back and redo the biology than keep the data around in digital form. You know, bluntly speaking, I think we've kind of failed at data management and I'm, I'm starting to be a little bit sterner and uh, a, a little bit sort of harsher in my communication methods. In particular, I'm starting to change my messaging and the way that I talk to customers and the way that I do consulting. The first trend I'm trying to promote is actually a culture change. I really want to stress the concept that storage, um, particularly scientific data storage, is treated as a consumable laboratory resource. Um, when you talk to investigators and you talk to scientists, they're very comfortable with tracking, justifying, budgeting for, and planning for how they use expensive consumable uh, items within their lab. And let's be blunt, storage is an expensive consumable. And I think it's beyond time that we need to sort of manage it as such. So active partnership with IT and science, and scientists need to be prepared to justify and actively manage this data. The days of unlimited quota and unlimited storage for a scientist just because they asked are, are sort of over. That's not tenable, it's not affordable. We can't you know, operationalize that effectively. So I'm really trying to sort of pitch this. Storage is a consumable, but we need to manage it as such. And then the second point, number two on that slide is something that I wanted to steal um, for a while. It's actually a trend that's coming out of the big DOD supercomputing sites in the United States where um, as they deploy, um, you know, as we're entering the exascale era and as they start to deploy multi-petabyte, massive, massive storage systems, they are not giving personal storage anymore. I'm gonna show you in the next slide here, um, the, 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 the nurse quota limit on home is 40, gigabit, 40 gigabytes and 1 million inodes. The trend that I'm trying to promote here in enterprise pharmaceutical biotech and research is no more giant home folders, no more data silos owned by a PI who keeps 10 years worth of data you know, in his home directory and then leaves and someone has to come in and articulate the mess. Moving forward, what I really wanna stress is Scientific data storage is allocated on a project or a group basis. It's no longer handed out to an individual or a PI. We've, we've sort of proven that we can't sensibly behave in that world. And this is just a screenshot. I stole this from the NERSC website the other day ago. And again, you can see here as um, they've got many, many different file systems. They're all quoted in different ways. But the coolest thing and the idea that I want to promote is your home directory is quoted at 40 gigs. You need more than that. you got to go to a project or a group share. I think that's a fantastic idea and a best practice that I really sort of want to encourage more broadly. Talking briefly a little bit about how our, our data gets siloed here, um, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff. Um, the, the size and breadth and complexity of data rich environments is increasing. That's both in the wet lab as instruments are getting faster and bigger, but it's also because we're adding more, si more sensors, more data sources. And also, you know, with COVID-19 and everything else, we're doing more and more collaborative resource. So, so simply speaking, the number of endpoints is, increasingly rap is increasing rapidly as well. So what we're starting to see here, the problems that silo data is starting to cause is um, if your network is not up to snuff, if you haven't started thinking about science DMZs and separating data traffic from business traffic on your network, we're starting to see situations where data can get stranded at the edge. One bit of good news is we are starting to see, you know, this was a little bit buzzwordy last year where they're talking about, you know, compute at the edge, but we're starting to actually see that happen. The simplest that, you know, the simplest example here is when you do a, a brief QC test on data that comes off of an instrument. You do a local analysis of the data after you've acquired it. Only if it passes the QC test do you take that additional step of you know, moving the data into your core for analysis and sort of full life cycle treatment. So um, there's a lot more interesting sort of compute and transformation happening now at the edge. Moving on to sort of the data management and you know, the buzzwordy trends here. Data lakes, 
We're still building them. They're real. They're effective. They're really, really useful, but um, there's still a lot of failures out there. And um, we could speak at length for why a data lake project fails. That's a really interesting topic in and of itself. And then finally, data commons. And there'll be a lot of people on the panel who are very, very familiar with data commons. And I just really wanted to throw out that um, Biotim really likes the Gen3 platform uh, from CTDS. And so there's a couple of URLs there if you're interested in what an open source uh, Gen3 based data commons looks like. And then finally, can't mention COVID-19 and some of the work that Bioteam's been volunteering with behind the scenes is um, we've been helping out with both the data organization and also the source code for Gen3 um, at a COVID-19 specific data commons hosted by the Chicago folks. And the URL for that is uh, down at the bottom if you want to go check it out. So the next topic here is dirty data. And um, it, it, the, the, the really issue here is that, um, you know, I've seen this myself in my career at my particular age. Um, you know, I entered the, the industry when I was deal when we were sort of dealing with data um, on paper and handwritten laboratory notebooks. And in one career generation, we've moved to sort of petascale data wrangling. And generally speaking, I think we've scaled capacity. You know, we've, we've not missed data. We've managed to store all of the data that we've generated, but we've really dropped the ball on literally everything else. Governance, curation, metadata, SOPs. Um, and honestly, IT can't do this for you. IT can't do this. Um, I solidly place the blame for you know, this issue on scientists and honestly scientific leadership who are oddly enough fearful of having difficult conversations with their scientists or unwilling to budget or unwilling to resource for you know, capabilities that they actually are going to need. And so this is really, really going to bite us, particularly as move it, we move into the ML and AI world where um, the cleanliness and cataloging and curation and tagging of our data is really essential if you want to get accurate results to, to come out of your ML and your AI workloads. Finally, the other thing I really want to talk about is biased data. There are tremendous war stories here about bad inputs or biased inputs uh, generating bad models, which then produce bad output, which then lead to bad outcomes. So it's, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility in the bio IT space. It's our responsibility as scientists to sort of understand the risks of biased data, unconscious, explicit. We have to understand the issues we, that we really need to get you know, clean data from diverse and equitable sources um, if we're going to have any hope of having both accurate results coming out of these models as well as good outcomes for all coming out of this. And this is one of my last slides because I, I really feel that this is kind of a strong area of, of our panelists and potentially they might, they might have a lot, about to say, a lot to say about this. Um, this is generally one of my fears about the ML and AI error that our history of bad data curation or bad data hygiene is going to combine with um, the problems in ML caused by bias or bad data. And we're going to get some really weird or some really negative outcomes from this you know, over the next couple of years. One final thing I wanted to do is from Slido, we've been soliciting some questions. So um, I did get a question here that I wanted to pre-stage and answer. And um, I will have to disappoint the audience. I'm not going to be able to answer the murder hornet question because uh, that's the focus of my thesis at YouTube University, and I, I plan to drop a hot preprint at BioIT World in October. So I'm just going to tackle the, the, the first question up here. So I really want to talk about stuff that I've got wrong. So this is kind of the, some of the things that I've been repeating myself in previous trends talks that um, I think I, I was actually wrong about. So number one, compilers matter again. Um, we saw a lot of real interesting data showing that commercial compilers were delivering significantly better performance than some of the open source tooling. I thought that would turn into um, a lot more work building scientific tools against different compilers uh, last year. Totally wrong. I haven't played with compilers, I think, in about 18 months at this point. Second thing I thought it would be accurate is that um, for the first time in a while, Intel has some serious competition. AMD has serious CPUs and a really interesting roadmap. I thought a lot of my 2019 HPC work would be focused on benchmarking, you know, helping companies make an AMD versus Intel procurement decision. I think that was a little ahead of the times that, you know, we, we tend to be a little bit conservative with CPU platforms. But given what we've seen with the Exascale supercomputing awards, I sort of expected to spend a lot more time benchmarking in 2019-20 and haven't seen it. Never really, never really sort of materialized in our enterprise uh, product portfolio. Finally, I talked a lot about this in the past about the, you know, the magic of automatic auto tiering storage. And it turns out um, I've seen this in the real world. That's actually not great for scientists. The issue we have here is that the, the sort of magical tiering of storage is usually predicated on things that don't map well to the way that we do science. So um, I don't want to have something move to a different tier or move to an archive based on a generic policy like the last time someone touched this file or the, the, the age at which this file was created. Um, that works great for corporate workloads, but it's really bad for science. 
we don't tend to work on a file age or last access time. We tend to work on a project or a team basis. So I'm modifying my messaging around here and really saying what I really would like to see is um, user self-service. I think scientists need to be able to make archive and tiering decisions. You know, a help desk ticket is okay, but if it requires hours of effort from an IT person, that's less than adequate. You know, self-service would be the goal. But in particular, I want to move from policy-driven tiering to allowing researchers to make tiering and movement decisions based on a project or group. And to do it either based on a path or a tag is the ideal way that I, I would like to see the sort of industry move. And finally, you know, I talked a lot about how awesome a single global storage namespace was, because if you if you give if you give scientists multiple namespaces, they store things in six different locations and it gets messy. But um, scientific leadership, I think we've had a lot of failure here that um, we have not adopted well to giant storage namespaces. We use them badly, we use them inefficiently, and things are just as messy in a giant namespace as they were in a separate namespace. Related to that, I'm really getting tired of scientists who've built entire careers as data scientists or entire publication track records on data intensive science who actively avoid trying to manage data or whine to IT or expect IT to do all of their jobs for them. I, I'm, I'm being blunt here. If your job is predicated on data intensive science, you need to do your job. You need to actively take responsibility for your data. And in many cases, that involves doing things that it's not really appropriate for IT to be doing, like making archive and tiering decisions based on that. And like I said, the, the, the last bit of this is, like I said, um, that we need to treat storage as a shared responsibility model between IT and science. I had a great colleague, Fernanda, mention that she hasn't really seen this experience in her world. Um, she's had a lot of experiences where there's been a great, fantastic communication pattern between IT and researchers. And I actually can say that I've seen the same thing. Um, scientists are not malevolent. They're not stupid. They're not trying to mess with IT. It's just that sometimes when you sit down with a scientist, their mental model of uh, a cost of 10 terabytes is based on the fact that that 10 terabytes costs $70 at Costco to buy. And so it, as long as your IT department is resourced and engaged to have true back and forth communication with the scientists, this stuff works out. However, in, in environments where that communication is not in place, we really have issues. And like I said, um, the era of scientists demanding free unlimited storage delivered to them on a platter from IT is over. Uh, if you are involved in high velocity, large data, if your career is predicated on data intensive science, you need to step up. You need to either take ownership for this or you need to actively collaborate with IT and sort of manage your, your consumable resource uh, in, in sort of a joint manner. So again, that's me complaining as an IT person. It's probably an appropriate way to sort of, um, you know, end my little trends talk here. And um, with that, I'm just going to say thank you. I'm not even going to read my acknowledgements. I'm just going to uh, pass it over, I think, to, uh, to Jeff from VAST. And uh, Jeff is going to have a few words, and he's going to toss it over to Ari, and then the smart people can take over.